A great man once said, everything I am or ever hope to be, I'll owe it all to mother. And isn't that true? Mothers so loving, so nurturing, they're our first taste of what God's love is all about. I usually preach on Mother's Day about a mother from the Bible, but uh, the Lord has led me to a different message today. And when that happens, it usually means somebody needs to hear it. So turn with me in your copy of God's Holy Word, if you would please, to John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and verses 9 and 10. Now, while you're looking that up in the Word, may I read to you some uh, proverbs that a first grade teacher gave to her children and she stopped halfway through and let them finish. Are you ready? Mom, if you'll pick up on this. You know, like a rolling stone gathers no moss. Okay. As you shall make your bed, and they answered, so you shall mess it up. <laughs> Better safe than punch a fifth grader. <laughs> Strike while the bug is close. It's always darkest before daylight saving time. Don't bite the hand that looks dirty. A miss is as good as a mister. You can't teach an old dog new math. If you lie down with the dogs, you'll stink in the morning. Where there's smoke, there's pollution. A penny saved is not much. <laughs> Laugh and the world laughs with you. Cry and you have to blow your nose. <laughs> Children should be seen and not spanked or grounded. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but here's something I know about. John chapter 10, and would you stand with me for the reading of God's holy word? I've just marked uh, verses 9 and 10, but let's start up at verse 7. John 10, beginning with verse 7. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Would you say that with me? Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. So teach us, O oh Lord, from your holy word about abundant life in you. Amen. Please be seated. If someone were to write a book on your life, a biography of your life, here's the book. Your name in large letters. Would the subtitle beneath it be Abundant Life in Christ? Because you see, that's what Jesus said he came to give. Came to give abundant life. Are you experiencing abundant life? Now, abundant life is not necessarily what is portrayed on commercials today. You know, lots of wealth and you got everything. Frankly, lots of people that have lots of that don't have abundant life. They have sad lives, as the trial of Johnny Depp is showing this week. But do you have abundant life, real life in Jesus? Oh, if you do, you know what life is all about. Jesus said, I came that you may have it. He wants you to have full life, abundant life, joy-filled life. Years ago, I heard a story about a couple that grew up in the country, and they had hardly been away from home. They had only been out of state a time or two. Had never been to New York City, and they, the, the couple decided, they, we're going to, you know, they've been dating. We decided we're going to get married. 
And they said, we're only going to do this once, so let's do it up right. Let's go to, to New York City and, and uh, check into one of those big hotels in their honeymoon suite. So they flew in a plane, first time to ever fly in a plane. It took their breath away. They picked up their feet when the plane lifted off so the weight wouldn't be so heavy, you know? Well, those kind of folks. And, and they landed and, and they took a taxi over to their hotel. Cost them an arm and a leg, they thought. You know, that we don't charge like that in the country. But, but they got to their hotel and the bellman met them at the door, took their luggage and escorted them up to the honeymoon suite, opened the door and let them in. And then the next morning, they came downstairs, and the manager met them. Oh, our honeymoon couple, how did you like the honeymoon suite? And the husband said, well, to tell you the truth, we were, we were really disappointed. He said, disappointed? Why? He said, well, it was just a narrow room, and there was just one cot there, wasn't even a bed, and we had no restroom. He said, now, wait a minute, didn't you turn the handle on the next door? He said, well, we thought that was somebody else's room. He said, come with me. <laughs> Went back upstairs, opened up the next door after the ante room, and found the honeymoon suite. There was a great basket of fruit basket welcoming the honeymoon couple and a beautiful view over the city. They had paid for the honeymoon suite, but they spent their night in the ante room. Now, when I think about that, I also think about how many of us Christians give our lives to Jesus who promised abundant life, but we spend our days in the vestibule and never enter the sanctuary of his abundant life. Jesus promised us abundant life, and there are three keys to it right here in John chapter 10. And the first key is, this, is salvation. Jesus said, I am the door. I am the door. And he's talking about sheep here. Now, the Bible doesn't do us a favor when it calls us sheep, all right? But, but Jesus said, I'm the door of the sheep. Now, what's he talking about? Back in that day, the shepherds would take the sheep out. Very, very quickly, they would um, obliterate all of the grass in their area, and they'd have to go to another area. And so many times the sheep were many, many miles away from where the, uh, the shepherd's home was. And so the owners of the land in those various areas would erect every mile or so, they would erect a large uh, enclosure out in the middle of a field, it would be high enough that the wolves couldn't get over or the bears couldn't get in, but it had no roof on it, and it only had one door, but there was no door there. It was just a doorway. And what would happen would be that the shepherd would stand in the doorway and let each sheep pass one at a time. The shepherd literally became the door for the sheep. And Jesus said to you and me, I am the door. Meaning, if we're going to go to heaven, we've got to go through the Lord Jesus Christ. God didn't give a plan A, B, C, and D. He didn't give a plan B through Buddha, a plan C through Confucius, a plan M through Mohammed. He only gave a plan J through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he said, others who come are thieves and robbers. If you're going to go to heaven, you've got to go through Jesus. Now, I know that's narrow. I know that's really narrow. But I don't want to be any broader than God's Word is. And when I get to heaven, I, will, I don't want God to say, well, you said... There were many roads to heaven. Oh, no. Jesus himself said, you must come through the door, and I am the door. Do you have Jesus? If you do not have Jesus as your Savior, you will not have abundant life. But let me tell you about a person I heard this very week who became a, a Christian and is now full of joy. I read about it this week. She may have become a Christian a little earlier. Those of you who like Hallmark movies, you know of Danica McKellar. You know of Danica? Well, she was raised in a, in a home that had some, a lot of skepticism about Christianity. And um, she herself was kind of skeptical about it. But uh, she had been listening to her friend 
Candace Cameron Bure uh, talk about the Lord Jesus in several ways. And she, um, Cameron mentioned a certain scripture. And Danica didn't understand it, so she called her and asked her about it. Candace Cameron Bure sent her a Bible and invited her to come to church with her. She began coming to church, and it wasn't long till she received Jesus as her Savior. And the, the story I read said she was now so filled with joy that she never had before. That's what I'm talking about, abundant life. You've got to come through Jesus. I led one lady, a middle-aged lady, to Christ, and uh, she, she was a lady that didn't smile much. But after she received Christ, the biggest smile broke out on her face. I said, Francis, what does that smile mean? She said, well, you see a smile on the outside, but really my heart is smiling on the inside. Abundant life I'm talking about. Another fellow I talked with for quite a while, um, he wouldn't receive Christ, even though I presented the plan of salvation to him several times. He didn't receive Christ. But uh, I heard he went into the hospital, even though he was a young man, fairly young man, in his 40s. That's, that's real young to me these days, all right? I had a birthday yesterday, so it's real young now to 40. Well, I, we'll, we'll go on. I visited him in the hospital, and I could just see his countenance was different. And I said, John, what, what's, what's going on? He said, well, you know, he said, I've been thinking about that Jesus you've been talking about. And he said, I think God laid me on my back here in the hospital so I'd look up and have to look up to him and think about him. I said, well, John, have you received Christ as your Savior? He said, I haven't, but I would sure like to. And within two minutes of entering his room, John asked Jesus into his heart. Now, God didn't heal him immediately, but you know what? He had joy in his life. He now had abundant life. Do you have abundant life in Christ? The Lord can give it to you. Abundant life in Jesus. That's what he wants us to have. The first key to, to, to abundant life is uh, salvation, going through the door. There's a second key that's mentioned here. Oh, by the way, speaking of doors, in Rome, there is a, a huge church, beautiful church. Some of you probably have been there. It's called St. Peter's Cathedral. It has marble floors on it, and the marble, a lot of it is red. It's, it's just, I've never seen anything like it. It's just gorgeous. But it's an old, old church, many centuries old, and it has huge doors that must weigh several thousand pounds each. The Pope said back in Martin Luther's day, that we're going to open this door to the church, this certain door on the side, that was called the Porta Sancta, the holy door, the sanctified door. We're going to open this door once every 50 years, every Jubilee year. And if you come through it, you'll be a Christian. To which Martin Luther replied, if a person becomes a Christian by stepping through that door, then the Pope is cruel for leaving it closed except on the 50th year. It's not uh, the Porta Sancta that makes us a Christian. It's Jesus that makes us a Christian. Salvation, the first key to abundant life. Now, the second key is sanctification. Sanctification is one of those 50-cent theological terms that basically means growing, growing in Christ, or being cleansed in Christ. Peter says that we're cleansed by the water of the Word. The Word of God cleanses us, and it, it helps us to grow. Now, when we become a Christian, we're a baby Christian, but we're supposed to grow in Christ. How do we grow in Christ? Through the Word of God through Christian fellowship like this, through your life groups that meet on Sunday mornings and at other times, through worship of the Lord. When you come together, how can you help but grow as a Christian when you come to this kind of worship here today? I mean, it's fabulous. You grow in Christ that way. And um, Jesus said, I'm the door. You must come in and out, he said. 
Now, let me explain again what that is. Here's the door, the big sheepfold. They're way miles away from home. If the shepherd left the sheep out in the field, the wild animals would get them, overnight particularly. So as before night comes, he ushers them into the enclosure. One at a time, they come through. And the shepherd has a staff, and he has a rod. Psalms 23 talks about that. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. The staff is so when the sheep falls into a gully or something, he can reach over with that crook and help it up again. The rod is so that he can beat off the wild animals. They're usually bigger than a, than a broom handle and got a knob at the end. And he, he stands in that doorway and he extends his, his rod. And the sheep come through one at a, time, at a time. Here comes the first sheep, and it's got some um, mud on its wool. So the shepherd stops the line, and he knocks the mud off the wool, and the sheep is clean, and he goes on through. The next sheep, his head is, is abrased because sheep butt head sometimes. I know there's no head butting here, but... Have you ever seen Christians butt heads with one another a little bit? And the shepherd takes olive oil and rubs it in. And it's a healing agent. The sheep get better more quickly. And then here comes the next one through. And that one has a tick on it. So he pulls the tick off, puts it down, stomps on it, and lets the sheep on through. And, and one after another, the shepherd cleanses the sheep as they come into his presence and come into the enclosure. Do you get what I'm saying, dear Christian? See why it's important to get into the presence of God every day? You get into his word, and he begins to cleanse you. You get into his word, and he takes that envy away. You get into his word and repent, and he takes those addictions from you. You get into the word of God, and he gives you purpose for tomorrow. You get into the word and the presence of the Lord Jesus. You pray, and God sets your heart straight and makes you happy again. You get into the word, and he takes you away from the world and puts you on a straight path. With, with Jesus. Get into the Word. Get into His presence. It's called sanctification. It's growing. See, if a person is where they started out at as a Christian and hasn't grown, then they're a baby who's still talking out, you know? <laughs> but we have to grow in Christ, don't we? We have to grow in Him. I remember my granddaughter, Claire, she's my oldest granddaughter. She turned 16 uh, not too long ago, last October, and she got her driver's permit and started driving with other people in the car. Well, she's done it long enough now that she was able to take the driver's test, which she passed, and she now has her driver's license. Her mother had a picture on Facebook of Claire getting in the car backing out the car and driving herself to school for the first time. And, of course, the mother was all worried. That, You've been there, haven't you? About her daughter going off on her own, now without an adult in the car. But it brought back memories to me of Claire when she was four years old. She had a birthday party. And we always called her our princess, and she dressed, the, the, the theme that day was being a princess. She dressed in a princess outfit. <laughs> and um, she had the crown and the wand and all of that. And when her mother put her down to bed late that night, she, she had some tears in her eyes, and she said, Claire, I'm kind of sad because one day you're going to be grown and you're going to leave home and I'll miss you. And Claire said, but Mama, one day I have to go off and live in my big palace. <laughs> you know, when, 
when they're four years old, just turning four, and think that way, we think that's cute. But what if she still thought that way when she was 16? We wouldn't think it was cute anymore. We'd think there's something wrong with that child. <laughs> and so it is with Christians. When we are a Christian at an early age, yes, that's great. Or even at a, at a, at a middle age, that's great. But we grow. That's the starting point. But then day after day, we get into his presence. Every day, we get into the presence of Jesus. Every day, we let his word get into us. Every day, we get closer to the Lord. And as we get closer to the Lord, he cleanses our lives and makes us what we ought to be in him. It's the second key to abundant life. The first key is salvation. The second key is sanctification. But the third key is service service. Notice that he says, they shall go in and out. See, the purpose of the sheep was not to come into the enclosure at night. That just kept them safe. But that wasn't their purpose. Their purpose was to go out and eat grass and have more wool and produce more sheep. That was the purpose of the sheep. And the purpose of the Christian even though it's so important to get into the presence of the Lord, the, our purpose is not to get into His presence. Our purpose is to serve Him. I love the church that had the sign on it, enter to worship, depart to serve. Our purpose is service in the name of Jesus. At our hotel last night, there was parked a big trailer called Send Relief. It's sponsored by your, South, your, your Southern Baptist Convention North American Mission Board, and it's a trailer um, that goes from church to church wherever they, they're asked to serve. And uh, they recruit local dentists to come and to, without any charge, fill poor people's teeth. I mean, that's a real service in the Lord's name. They also recruit people to witness to those that come in, and so some receive Christ almost every time. They have a similar medical uh, uh, trailer like that. It's really neat to see God's people serve. Where is your place of service? For some of you, it's teaching Sunday school, and I've heard what a good job so many of you do. For some, it's singing in the praise team or in that marvelous choir that was here. Uh, on Easter Sunday. For some of you, it's, uh, it's working in the sound booth. I always have to be kind to the sound people because they can cut me off any time, you know. <laughs> and, and that's a real service for Jesus. For others, it's a service outside the walls of the church. It's a service of reaching out to those that don't know Jesus yet. It may be carrying a, a plate of brownies to a new neighbor who's moved in, welcoming them to the community, but also inviting them to the Lord's house. What's your service in the name of the Lord? I know this, the church is growing, I can tell, week by week. But you know what? There was a day it was even much larger than this. You can think in your mind of some people who used to be who, who are not, May I ask you, may I challenge you, this very week, call three people whom the Lord puts on your mind, whom you've been missing, and ask them, come back to our church. God's got a great future for us. Would you do that? Others may want to just go see them instead of calling, or even write a letter, whatever, whatever the Lord leads you to do. He'll lead you. Service in the name of the Lord, it's so important. In Israel, there is the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea has rivers running into it, mostly the Jordan River, but some other small tributaries. But it doesn't have any going out. See, it's the lowest place on planet Earth, 1,300 feet below sea level. And water comes in, but none goes out. How does it get out? The sun evaporates it. In fact, it's evaporating it faster than the water coming in. But when the sun evaporates it, it takes the H2O, but it doesn't take the little trace minerals out. And so the Dead Sea gets saltier and saltier and saltier. It's seven times more salty than the Mediterranean. 
You can literally sit out there on, I've, I've seen people just sit out there and reading the paper, just sitting. You don't have to struggle to stay afloat. It's so heavy, the water is, you can just sit in it. You know, uh, uh, Christians can be like the Dead Sea. Without service outside, we can take in, and after a while we get so salty, we, we just we can't give out anymore. But when you give out in the name of the Lord Jesus, the Lord pours in. We give out in spoonfuls, the Lord pours in in shovelfuls. He will do that. And it's part of the secret of abundant life. Abundant life comes through salvation. It comes through sanctification, getting cleansed. But it comes also through service in the name of Jesus. I heard the story of John, a little boy in Uganda. Unfortunately, Uganda went through a civil war, and a tribe attacked his village and killed all of the people in the village. John, unfortunately, saw his mother murdered in front of his own eyes. I can't imagine. But when that happened, John turned and ran off into the jungle, and they, they didn't catch him. Just a small child. Over a year later, some workers in the jungle area came across a little boy. <laughs> he was still alive. He told them his name was John. He told them what had happened in the village. They said, but how did you live? He said, a group of monkeys found me and fed me. They took him to some anthropologists, and they said, oh, that, that, that couldn't happen. There, of all the hundreds of types of monkeys, there are only just a few types that eat the kind of food that would nourish a, a boy. And they brought him a book that had pictures of all the different tribes or types of monkeys, and, and he pointed out the type that had taken care of him. And sure enough, it was a kind that ate the kind of things that would nourish a boy. So they said, yeah, it may be true, but we still don't believe it. So they decided to take him to the zoo because the zoo had a tribe of this kind of monkeys. When they got there, he instinctively went over to their cage, began chatting with the monkeys, and knew what they were going to do before they did it. And then the anthropologist said, yeah, this group of monkeys actually raised this boy. And I, I thought about that story, and I thought, well, you know, that's wonderful he survived. But then I thought a little more deeply about it. Here he is, born a human, raised by monkeys. How many of us are born again in Christ, but actually raised under the conventions and dictates and mores of this world. Shall we pray? Lord, we ask you to give us abundant life. Without you, we can do nothing. You've told us that in your holy word. And so, Lord, we come to you asking your help to live abundantly like you promised us. And right now, dear friends, I ask that if, if you have never received Christ as your Savior, but you would like to, would you just pray something like this? Talk to him. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I need you. Please forgive my sin. Come live in my heart and help me live this abundant life that you promised. And then there are others of us here who have been saved, but we fail to come into his presence day by day, read his word, pray, seek his presence. Would you commit yourself right now to do that, to be cleansed, knowing that he's going to give abundant life as you do. And then for each of us, there's a service to do for the Lord. He'll show us what if we'll seek him. 
Show us then, O Lord. Open our hearts to you. Put on our hearts exactly what you would have us do for your kingdom. And whatever you tell us, Lord, that's what we'll do. In Jesus' name we promise it. Amen.